Welcome to Literary and Jury Charge Practice. Let's start out with some literary practice and this is an article called Inside the Bradley Manning Trial. Ready? Here we go. Teaming up with Joe's firm was very assuring to me. I knew I would need assistance to meet the delivery request time and that various hiccups would occur along the way, and I knew that Joe's longtime experience in this profession and his vast knowledge, supportive staff, and the infrastructure his company had in place would make handling a job of this magnitude possible, Roland said. According to Grabowski, a court reporter since 1976 and owner of the Gore Brothers firm since 1996, signing on with Roland to support coverage of the case was not that easy of a task to make happen, especially in light of the many non-traditional rules and procedures followed by the military's judicial system. In addition, there was the matter of ensuring through enough protection for not only Roland but for his own staff as well given the international newsworthiness of the case. We were negotiating through an unfamiliar process with taking on this case. Everyone had heard about this trial. I would go online and read articles that said there was going to be protests outside of the base. I was nervous about having my company and its reporters identified on the Foundation's website in the event that some radical individual or group tried to make a statement, said Gabrowski, who had worked in the discovery and arbitrations arenas as well as abroad in Spain. Greece and Poland. This was a great opportunity, though, to be a part of history in the making. The case was so vast that we might not even find out the full impact of Manning's actions for another 10 to 20 years. It was all very interesting, Grabowski said. Inside the press gallery, each morning we would arrive in the parking lot and have our vehicles inspected by the military canines before we could even enter the base, said Roland. Then there would be a procession of vehicles to the Media Operations Center, where we would trade our identification for a media credential. Inside the small cinema-type viewing room, members of the press and the stenographers were able to watch video of the proceedings that was often poor and accompanied by sometimes less than acceptable audio. Additionally, the fact that the members of the press were not permitted to bring in recording devices or cell phones to aid in capturing what the courtroom's voice-activated cameras and microphones were sending back to the screen only added to some of the frustration of covering the proceedings. According to Roland, some of the members of the media complained that the quickness of the audio, for example, was almost comical and often made it impossible to catch the stipulations made between the defense and prosecution. We were all doing the best we could, and some of us were able to get enough of the content that it could be edited down to be readable, Roland said. But there were also various connection problems that would often occur with the the most frequent being what we call I called hiccups in the streaming with no time lag in the audio. A piece of the proceeding would just disappear, typically about half a sentence, he said. No audio assistance was allowed, and once we were on base, we weren't allowed to leave until lunchtime or the end of the day. So if there were problems with my system, I had no way to access any additional equipment I might have in my car. Although not a member of the news media, Roland said that he and his machine were warmly welcomed by the journalists who worked side by side with, with them during the trial and that it wasn't uncommon for one of them to turn to him if they had missed something that was said during the proceedings. Many of the reporters with me would ask for quotes, especially if they wanted to get an article out to their outlets right away. Many of them also said that they wished they had the skills to use the steno machine because it would make their lives much easier. I would show them my machine and their typical reaction would be one of amazement and I, that I could capture the spoken word that fast. Let's try a little jury charge. 
on Cancer. We'll take it a little bit at a time. Here we go. As suggested above, lip cancer attacks men more often than women. Strangely enough, it also affects the lower lip more often than the upper one. Doctors suspect from many actual cases that too much heat or even overexposure to the sun's rays creates conditions that favor the development of lip cancer. Smokers who have a history of holding on to the hot short end of a cigar or who favor the old-fashioned clay pipe seem prone to develop this kind of malignant tumor. So do men who make their living out of doors as farmers, for example, and sailors. A cancer of the lip is easy to see. The first sign may be a crack in the skin that does not heal or a wart-like lump that does not rapidly become smaller and disappear. From either of these beginnings, <coughs> a bleeding sore may develop with or without pain. Finally, the flash at the base of the sore may feel firm and swollen. Any of these symptoms should send you to your doctor. Don't let pus in a sore or lump of this kind make you think that you must have some sort of ordinary infection. The cancer may be there all the same. The only sure way to find out is to see your doctor about it. A malignant tumor of the nose is also unusually easy to detect. Such a cancer often begins in the skin outside the nose or in the cartilage that divides the nostrils. The warning signs are like those of lip cancer, sores that don't heal, lumps that are not cleared up by ordinary treatment or infections that in themselves are secondary reveal the possible presence of cancer. A malignant tumor may also develop in the glands of the nose's inner lining or in the branch-like endings of the olfactory nerves that govern the sense of smell. A cancer also can begin in the bony structures or bridge of the nose or in the sinuses that connect with the nose from the cheekbone and elsewhere in the skull. In any of these locations, a malignant tumor may make itself known by a steady discharge, foul smelling, and blood bloody from the nose. Cancer of the sinuses may give rise to pain in the jaw or cheek. It also may cause toothache or persistent headaches. Any of these signs should be checked by your doctor right away. Let's try some literary now. This is called Professionalism, Professionalism and Ethics. Ready? Here we go. It is difficult to think about either ethics or professionalism without running into the into the other. The two ideas overlap and influence each other in both thought and practice. Ethics is at its simplest is what is right or wrong, good or bad. Merriam-Webster defines ethics as the principles of conduct governing an individual or a group. Our ethics determine the choices we make. Professionalism to me is the carrying out of the choice our code of ethics tells us is best. It is the quality of our profession as shown by our work, what we do and what we produce. Our moral code is either reinforced or shaped and molded differently when we see the effects of our actions, the effects of our professionalism. Ethics and professionalism are the skeletal and muscular systems that support and carry out our actions and choices. We, When our ethical base is firm and we consistently act upon our moral principles, we develop integrity in our business practices. In court reporting specifically, we develop fairness, impartiality, and truthfulness. It means we produce accurate transcripts, are open about conflicts of interest, are neutral to each side, and know our limits when accepting and giving gifts. These qualities are witnessed by those we interact with in our work, and they can then place trust and esteem in us. I believe every action of every reporter is woven together to create the image of our profession, so the ethics and professionalism of each reporter matter. I come from an industry suffering an identity crisis triggered by an insufficiency of professionalism and ethics. As a journalism student at the University of North Texas, I remember clearly my enthusiasm for facing the challenge of joining a field, learning by trial and error how to adapt 
to the changing times, but in my senior year, I began to realize that the basic struggle of journalism couldn't be attributed to the times or to technology. The problem was one of trust. A Gallup poll from September 29, 2010 shows that 57% of Americans' trust in the media is not very much slash none at all. The integrity and professionalism of journalists has been seriously de depreciated by inaccurate and biased reporting and by not remaining fair and impartial. People stopped believing that ethics were a tenant of journalism, and this has crippled the profession. This failure of an industry that I aspired to and held certain trust in myself had, has underscored to me the value of a professional image that is built upon a firm foundation of ethics. Though court reporting and journalism generally maintain very different standards and goals, one vital shared principle is the demand for commitment to the code of ethics. The ethical decisions we make as court reporters affect the quality of our work and the quality of our work relationships. These in turn affect the future of the court reporting profession. If attorneys, judges, and the public are three most important relations, cannot trust our work or us to be fair and truthful, support and then demand for us will decline. These principles are no less important while re preparing to be a court reporter. Rules are created in schools not just to keep students from cheating, but to begin developing that ethical base they will need in order to maintain the court reporting profession at its current high standard. It does not take time and practice to build a code of ethics. Students should begin studying the NCRA Code of Professional Ethics early on, understanding expectations and specifics of how professionalism in court reporting plays out is the first step to de developing ethics. Having had a personal view of journalism's failure of ethics and professionalism, I have gained focus on the importance of these concepts. They are the foundation and support of any profession. They guide our choices as court reporters, strengthen our relationships, and ensure both the quality and future of our work. Right, we'll get back to some jury charge. <clears throat> Ready? Here we go. Cancer in the mouth, like lip cancer, shows a preference for men. Persons who use smoking and chewing tobacco without restraint or improper dental hygiene may develop malignant tumors in this location. Jagged teeth, poorly fitting false teeth, or teeth that do not meet properly when the mouth is closed can cause undesirable friction against the inside of the cheeks that might result in cancer. Although there is little evidence to support the statement, the habit of drinking excessively hot liquids has been cited as a possible predisposing factor. Failure to keep the mouth and teeth clean also may create conditions favorable to the de development of a malignant tumor in the mouth. Nevertheless, it must be admitted that mouth cancer in most cases cannot be explained by chronic irritation alone. Cancer of the gum or inner cheeks starts out in much the same manner as cancer of the lip and with similar symptoms, running or wart-like wart -like sores and white spots anywhere in the mouth are danger signals. Soft puppy, puffy gums that bleed easily and often for no apparent reason may be an early sign of a malignant growth. On the tongue also, cancer may develop from a sore that fails to heal either by itself or after a short period of simple medication. A malignant tumor in this location may appear as a lump on the tongue or just underneath its surface. Such a lump may be topped by a whitish scab or a painful open sore. Sudden per paralysis of the tongue, particularly if it is accompanied by pain, is another danger sign. So is bleeding or the discharge of odorous pus from the tongue, since these may be the product of a cancerous sore that has become infected. Only a doctor can tell you if you have cancer or not, and only a doctor can treat you if it turns out that you have cancer. Let's 
see what else we have for literary practice. This article is called Helping Yourself and Those Who Come After. Ready? Here we go. After almost 40 years as a reporter, I've noticed that attorneys and judges are speaking faster. Police officers and various law enforcement personnel are chewing their words more, and the record in general is suffering for it. Of course, it's always been a challenge to punctuate the spoken word, but seriously, who would have thought the English language would become so unrecognizable? For many years, and maybe even from the beginning, I wondered if there were a class in law school teaching the appropriate way to make a record. After much consideration, I've decided that those soon-to-be attorneys tolling away to grasp the law completely miss their evidence class indeed, along with being educated in making a good record. Motor mouth does not even come close to today's speakers. The new words are speed talking. Who said that was okay? I certainly didn't get that memo. What makes all this worse is that today's lawyers are actually proud of themselves when no one can understand what they said and their record reflects it. I've been known to stop attorneys to say I can't even hear that fast. What's a reporter committed to producing the best record possible to do? Recently, I read an article by Diane DeResta, who is the author of the public speaking bestseller, Knockout Presentations, How to Deliver Your Message with Power, Punch, and Pizzazz. It was entitled Six Sloppy Speech Habits and was addressing how to get ahead in the interviewing process in today's employment scene. As I read it, I was astounded how well it could be adapted to attorneys. I've always felt that part of my job was to teach and train people in making a clear and concise record. I decided that a message available for attorneys was a good use of their time while waiting in court for their case to be called, so I've been handing the following out when the opportunity arises and have them available on council tables to be perused. Feedback has been positive. See what you think. And while you are, think about all those reporters coming after you who will appreciate a little positive training of attorneys, not to mention the newbie lawyers you could teach. Speaking well on the record. Here are six common language mistakes and how to keep them from sabotaging your presentation in court. Non-words, filler words such as um, ah, uh, you know, okay, or like tell the court you're not prepared and make you sound like a valley girl or boy. A better strategy is to think before you speak, taking pauses and breaths when you lose your train of thought. Everybody utters an occasional um, but don't let it start every sentence. Up talk, a sing-song or rising inflection at the end of every sentence creates a tentative impression and makes it sound as though you're asking a question instead of making a definitive statement. You need to speak with conviction when selling yourself in an argument. Bring your information down when ending intonation down when ending a sentence to avoid talking up. Grammatical errors. You detract from your point when you use incorrect grammar or slang. Expressions such as ain't, she don't, me and my friend, and so I goes to him aren't appropriate. Be sure you speak in complete sentences and that tenses agree. Court is not the venue for regional expressions or informality. Sloppy speech. Slurring words together or dropping their endings impair, impairs the clarity of your message. To avoid slurring and increase understanding, speak slowly and distinctly. Make a list of commonly mispronounced words and practice saying them when preparing for the hearing. Speed talking. While everybody is a bit anxious in court, you don't want your information to fly by like a speeding bullet. A rapid speaking rate is difficult to follow and speed talkers are seen as nervous. Slow down your racing heart by doing some breathing exercises before the hearing. To avoid rushing, when you finish a sentence, count two beats before continuing. Don't be, af be afraid of silence. Pausing is an effective communication technique. The judge and parties need a few seconds to process what you just said anyway. Weak speak. Wimpy words modify or water down your conviction and in the end your position. When you pepper a conversation with hopefully, perhaps, I feel, kind of, and sort of, 
The message you convey is a lack of confidence. Use power words such as I'm confident that I take the position that or I recommend. The language you use gives the listener an impression about your level of confidence and conviction. The bottom line. You don't have to study elocution to speak well. Simply slow down, take time to pronounce all the syllables, and leave slang at home. The more record conscious you are and the better record that you make will go a long way in making you stand out as a lawyer, and it will certainly endear you to judges and court reporters as well. And that will conclude our literary and jury charge practice.